I read it and said later. I think one of the first things I want to ask you is what was it like writing this book? And not just in terms of themes and topics that are discussed in this book, but being in the archives of the Supreme Court of India. And also your experience of, sort of seeing the Supreme Court from the other side, because as far as I know, you were a law clerk to a judge previously. So, yeah, do you think those experiences have really shaped the way you look at the Constitution and the Supreme Court? Sure, so uh, a lot of um, scholarship we do is actually influenced by biography. So I went to law school uh, in the early 2000s uh, at a time where a couple of things were happening. So on the one hand, uh, a lot of social movements, um, this is the time when the right to food uh, campaign was going on, the education campaign was going on, RTI was in the news. Social movements were adopting constitutional language, approaching courts, sort of celebrating the court's declaration of rights. But around about the same time, um, a lot of what we would describe as progressive legal academics were increasingly suspicious of the court. So I'm thinking of Usha Ramnathan, Aditya Arlinda Mandelita Menon, Anush Bhavania, all of whom were pointing out that the sort of so-called PR revolution uh, in the 80s had actually not um, delivered. And in fact, what it had done is it had made the courts more powerful, uh, but actually removed uh, the ability of poorer or more marginal citizens to make claims. So that's the kind of puzzle that I was, I was struck with and I was trying to investigate. Um, and uh, much of the writing of the court has really been through the reading of judgments um, for two reasons. One is that uh, for lawyers, that's the kind of final word. Uh, when you go to law school, you're trained to find what is the uh, precedent value of the judgment, what is a writer, and you sort of distill it to that. Um, and non-lawyers either didn't study the court or uh, the only thing they would access the judgment itself and then do analysis of uh, its literary quality or the kind of rhetoric that it used. Um, so I uh, realized that a lot of the for me, it wasn't as interesting as the decision of the final court was not as interesting as the fact that something came to court in the first place and what the conversation around that uh, around that particular conflict was. So I was trying to get access to um, case files, which I thought would be easy. Um, most people who work in legal history in the US and other places find them in the National Archives. Uh, but in India, because of archival practices, uh, the case files, uh, with very few exceptions, um, lie within the court's registry itself. And most courts are mandated to preserve it uh, forever, uh, which they don't. Um, so uh, getting access to the Supreme Court files was hard. Um, uh, I had privileged access in some ways because uh, the judge at clerked for had become CJI at that point in time. So at least met me. And I had to spend sort of two evenings convincing him that there was something beyond the judgment that I could look at. Um, the files uh, in those days, and I think still are kept in cloth sacks at the bottom of the Supreme Court record room. Uh, they're mostly consulted by AORs, so the rules allow the AOR to look at a specific file. There's no system for someone to go in and look at, say, 200 files or something like that, which is what I wanted to do. Um, and the Supreme Court, at least, they're well catalogued. So once I got permission, I could send them a list of cases, and I was only working off a list of published judgments. So unreported judgments, there was no list that I could find, uh, and they would bring those files to me. Um, there was a file in the 1980s, so most rate petitions. Um, under, uh, so for example, for example, the AK Gopalan file has gotten quite a system. Some of the other files kind of crumbled in my hands when I looked at them. The other thing was the law student, and sort of assumed that, uh, even the law I kind of assumed that going to court was the most obvious thing to do, right? If something's wrong, you go to court. That's the sort of natural instinct. Um, but just trying to get access as a PhD scholar, uh, get, trying to get into the court every day, um, it made me realize that actually coming to court in most cases is the last resort. Uh, and, and it's really a sort of testament to either the extent of desperation the litigant has or the degree of like energy and things they're able to bring into it despite the odds they make it up there. So I think my, my sense of the court and the constitution changed a lot through the process of, of working in the court itself. Yeah. So that's very interesting to hear. And you mentioned something about PIR, which is the Prior Jurisdiction, and whether it's done more harm than good. Do you think you agree with scholars like Anjit Kavanya who talk about how the PIR has actually become a tool which is used against the marginalized rather than for them? So, uh, for those who don't know Anuj's argument, um, Anuj uh, looks at the of the PIR in the 1980s uh, and he sort of argues uh, quite provocatively that the PIR is often seen as traditionally a kind of uh, way which traditionally repairs its reputation after the emergency. Uh, the judges who pushed the PIL were the pro uh, Congress judges during the emergency. They kind of rehabilitate their reputation by picking up the story of um, public people's rights. And Anuj argues that actually that's, the PIL is an extension of the emergency 
because like the emergency, you use the idea of the people and you allow for an unelected government to sort of push forward its agenda. Uh, and a few things that both Anuj and others like Usha Ramana can point out is what happens with the PIR is it stops being a, a case that's a conflict. So you say it's not between A versus B, there's a problem to be solved. Uh, the litigant or the, the person who brings it to court becomes irrelevant, the judge sort of takes over. Uh, I think the most famous one is Sheila Barse, where at one point in time she says, I don't want these orders, I don't want the case to be done in this way, and the judge said it doesn't matter because it's about public interest, you have no longer any say because we've taken over. Um, but most of the work that uh, Anuj's book focuses on, and even the work that other scholars have done, have looked at a certain kind of PIL. Uh, they're largely concerned with either urban land or environment. And there's a very clear, um, if you if you sort of uh, left oriented, there's a very clear class interest. If you're not, there's a very clear strategic interest that uh, when it's questions of environment, uh, the environment as a whole often trumps over the lives of ordinary people. So, uh, for example, Kaveri Hill's uh, work shows how the waste um, markets in Delhi was pushed out of Mutka because of kind of environmental integration. Anuj's work shows how um, they use the kind of PI narrative on the Delhi master plan to push out all these regular markets. At the same time, um, malls were set up and certain people profited from shops moving into these malls. Um, however, if you look at a wider range of PIs on certain other things, the intervention at least initially was very effective. Um, I'm thinking of a Senator cartoon, things that deal with uh, not necessarily creation of new policy, but basically the failure of the government to act. So, um, uh, under trial, the state in jail for a long time, badly run uh, um, sort of um, rescue or rehabilitation homes. Uh, and there's also something different about the early 2000s PIL. Um, I think the right to food movement is a great example where the PIL doesn't come in because of one concerned individual. It comes in uh, after almost a decade of um, on the ground activism around a certain question, building a kind of popular constituency around an idea. And what the court does is just gives expression and legal force to the idea. And then the government follows up by enacting it through law. So you can look at the relationship between social movements, the court, and uh, the now much criticized NAC. It seemed to be like a kind of partnership that worked for that period of time. So I'm hesitant to condemn PIs as a whole, but I think what Anuj uh, and others point out very clearly is that it allows for a certain kind of judicial adventurism, uh, which, uh, given the state of the judiciary, uh, one might want to be more conservative about. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And also what you mentioned, right, about the petitioners slowly becoming less and less significant in these kind of constitutional cases. Sure. Another thing that we're seeing, which I think is in sort of, you know, stark contrast to what you uh, mentioned in your book, is that in the initial first two decades, you saw a lot of ordinary citizens, especially those belonging to marginalized classes, like Muslim butchers, sex workers, etc., approaching the court and then asserting their rights. But now, in a lot of strategic litigation, there is this tendency where either civil society organizations are approaching courts or you're looking for these eminent persons who are like, you know, bureaucrats and parliamentarians to approach the court. Because there is this feeling that these people are more sympathetic petitioners. So in our attempt to get these kind of positive outcomes from courts and be more sympathetic to judges, are we also playing into a certain kind of like respectability politics which invisibilizes the marginalized in cases which affect them the most? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. I'll just sort of give you a summary if you haven't had a chance to read the book. Um, so what I found was, uh, contrary to the popular notion that the court is conservative in its first 25, 30 years, you often find cases where litigants who are sort of seen as small people are actually successful. Uh, and they're successful um, not because of some individual enlightened indi person from the group who goes to court, it's because these groups are able to organize. So it's not that uh, every landless person is able to get to court, but people who are in urban professions, uh, vegetable sellers, uh, in some cases beggars, prostitutes, are able to form sort of associations. Uh, there's a kind of exchange of legal knowledge. In some cases, there's fundraising. So police reports talk about how in GB Road they're collecting money from clients to mount a legal challenge to the new CETA Act. Uh, so they're able to sort of bring themselves before court. Uh, but the political respectability plays out there as well. So uh, one of the reasons why these groups come to court and the extent to which they're successful is the extent to which they're able to hide their identity. So when the sex workers come to court, uh, they make two claims. Uh, the first is we have a right to practice our profession, sex work is the oldest profession. And the second is that the uh, uh, magistrate does not have the power to expel someone from his jurisdiction without giving them a right to fight it. So the first bit, which is about the right to practice uh, sex work, drops off pretty early on. Um, the courts very early on say you can restrict this in public interest. But the second bit, which is not a specific right for sex workers, but a more general right 
for citizens gains traction. And this is also a time when most magistrates are not judicial magistrates, they're executive magistrates, and the courts are, are very suspicious of these magistrates exercising their power. So, they, so to the extent at which a claim becomes generalizable, it gets more traction. Um, the difference, I think, is decision making. So un until the matter comes to court, uh, when it's a community bringing a case, there is some extent of the community involvement decision making. Whereas in the cases we see from the 80s and 90s, when it's um, public spirited individuals, uh, it's not clear that they've actually consulted uh, with the community that they're trying to represent. But they've often just read a newspaper story and they sort of showed up in court. Uh, the early court tries to create fact-finding bodies. Um, so the best example, of course, is um, Kapila Hingura, who passed away a few years ago, who really, in some ways, starts PI in India. Um, so when she brings up Senator Khatun case uh, before the court, the court sort of appoints her as a kind of commissioner, sends her to Bihar to collect information, uh, and there's a kind of fact-finding process that is transparent. Um, and it seems increasingly uh, the fact-finding process becomes irrelevant. Uh, or um, the people who are appointed as amicus uh, tend to just be other lawyers in the court, uh, not necessarily people who have either expertise or a particular affinity with the group that they're representing. Um, I think all litigation has a certain kind of political respectability, but um, there's something distinct about the post 90s litigation. I think that also has to do with, um, uh, on the one hand, liberalization, and on the second hand, the emergence of this kind of world of NGOs. Um, uh, the NGO as a form doesn't really exist before the 1980s. Uh, I don't think we've done enough work to figure out when, what is an NGO, when does it become a player, uh, to what extent is an NGO regulated, uh, who decides why something is an NGO and why something uh, is not. Um, um, and uh, uh, the politics of respectability in terms of who becomes a respectable person also needs to change over a period of time. Um, I think, uh, as you guys probably know, I think uh, lawyers who litigate for a court have a really good sense of what that particular court or judge would respond to. Uh, and I wouldn't sort of say you should not play that game. Uh, sometimes it's really useful. Uh, also, a related question that's sort of lost from there. Uh, right? Like, uh, you said that if you have to litigate, then you choose what kind of synthetic conditioner you want. But I think a more fundamental question is why litigate in the first place? Except, especially in this kind of the political environment that we have, where going to courts increasingly seems like a lost cause. Do you think there is symbolic value still in going to courts? And does that have you know, sort of these ripple effects in society where it mobilizes further action? Or do you think in certain cases it can actually distract people and public attention from on-ground protests and other forms of advocacy which are also possible? That's a big question. So um, in the book, I look at sort of four sets of cases and um, if I sort of evaluate it clinically, uh, of the four sets of litigants, um, two lose definitely. Uh, one wins a marginal victory, and one wins somewhat of a victory through uh, a kind of small clause which allows them to continue to do what they're doing. Um, so they're not stories of like celebrated victories that, that are coming out. Um, but I think um, the purpose of going to court is not actually is not necessarily getting relief um, from the court. In many of these cases. These groups go to court because they're sort of desperate. Uh, these are all groups that um, are unpopular in minorities after independence. So uh, the Nehruvian government's sort of argument is, uh, look, um, we are an elected government for the first time in the history of India. We clearly have popular support. Uh, we are continuing with the mechanism of colonial government because the problem isn't with the mechanisms. So the colonial CRPC is fine, as is sort of around retention, uh, because we are, we are democratically elected and we're using it for purposes of general good. So uh, it becomes very hard for these groups uh, who are easily caricatured. So there's a kind of uh, anglicized uh, Parsi figure. There are uh, Muslim women engaged in sex work. There's the butcher who's always been this horrific figure. And the kind of petty shopkeeper trader who's seen as a um, kind of parasite living on the masses. Uh, these are also groups that can't do well in elections. Uh, in some ways, they had more power in, colonial, in the colonial period because they were able to make certain kinds of claims based on their cultural status that they can't do anymore. So they turn litigation almost out of our desperation. There's no sort of other way for them to make their claim. Uh, and a lot of the litigation, um, even when they, when, when they don't succeed, allows them to mobilize. So the, perhaps the most striking example is um, the challenge of the cow slaughter laws. Um, so the court case that we've often studied in law school is called Muhammad Ali Qureshi and others uh, versus the state of Bihar. And when I looked at the file, I realized the others involved 3,000 individual named litigants from across four states. Uh, and they've all signed. Um, and almost all of them, uh, they stay different professions, but they all have Qureshi as a kind of surname. 
and then you realize uh, the Qureshi Jamaat is, uh, I think the best way to describe it would be a subcast of Muslims uh, in North India, who are engaged very specifically in uh, dealing with uh, uh, bovine carcasses. So one of the claims they make in the court is that we can't go and start butchering goats or chickens because there are other kinds of groups that work with that. Our traditional profession has been, to, has been working with, with, with cattle. Uh, the Jamaat has annual meetings and they talk about the duration annual meetings. Um, they're clearly working with working with politicians as well. Um, and then they win a very narrow victory because the court ultimately says cow slaughter can be uh, banned, but you can't have an absolute ban. Um, so, uh, because it's protected under the constitution as, as a part of uh, an unhealthy profession, uh, the litigants are able to show that an absolute ban on cow slaughter actually hurts animal husbandry, allows for sort of weak cows to reproduce, it allows for old cows to be abandoned in damaged crops. Uh, so they have that kind of clause that says uh, aged cows can be um, can be uh, uh, can be killed, and the Qureshis then work with that clause. So every time the government say, okay, uh, only cows above the age of twenty four can be killed, the Qureshis go to court and they point out the average lifespan of a cow is fifteen years. So by saying that you know uh, uh, cows only after the age of twenty four can be killed is sort of uh, making the first um, uh, case fall apart. Um, so it allows the group to mobilize. Um, it's also there in the sex worker chapters, for example. Um, we see cases being filed on the same day in Delhi, Allahabad, Bombay, and Calcutta. We also see stories of a dancing girls union in Allahabad that's demonstrating the silent march by sex workers outside parliament. And I don't have a smoking gun that shows, look, they're all working together and they're all doing this. So one only draws through implication that this allows for a certain kind of mobilization. So even when they lose, the sex work is very clearly lose. Supreme Court says in sort of paternalistic way, uh, Basically, depraved people are a danger to society, and them, and they can be controlled. And their rights can be restricted. Uh, but five years later, the, the sex workers are saying, "Well, Article 19 protects our right to right to a profession." And uh, in the 90s, the Bar Mahila uh, Samanvya Committee in, in Kolkata, which is the largest sex workers union in India, prints out a pamphlet, where the first page of which has Article 19 on it. So it seems that it doesn't matter what the court says; they're going to make that claim anyway. Which I think is a powerful reminder that. Um, the kind of final authorship of the constitution is not necessary in the Supreme Court. There are multiple ways of, uh, of claiming it and, and, and holding up a particular standard. That makes a lot of sense because especially today, we're seeing the constitution being increasingly used as the sort of rallying point. You have protesters reading out the preamble in India Gate. You have tribal villagers inscribing the preamble on tablets in their uh, yeah. respective mm -hmm. villages. and. But as this is all happening, despite the fact that there is extremely low level of public confidence in the Supreme Court, yeah. which is the chief body responsible for interpreting and enforcing the Constitution. And I think your book says that these two things are not mutually irreconcilable. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the worst things that can happen to a historian is your work becomes relevant. <laughs> which is, you know, you're writing about usually unpleasant things and then you're like, oh wait, uh, this is less than so what's happening today. Um, so, uh, I think there's one trend which has always been there, which is right from the point of time the constitution was being written. Uh, particular groups were deeply interested in the kind of um, political range that has been set up. So, um, uh, Anit Shani, who's a political scientist, and I have been looking at letters written to the Shri uh, between 1946 and 49, uh, from a range of groups uh, from all across India. Uh, and groups have been obsessed with various things. So, the, some people are writing letters about Optroy because they're trading groups that so they're really concerned about, like, market taxes. Um, there are some general, uh, the 1940s version of WhatsApp uncles saying, I have written the constitution myself, here's my copy of it, you guys can just use this text. But a lot of them are sort of caste or linguistic groups who want very specific protections uh, from this from this new constitution. Um, and even in the 50s and 60s, the kind of traditional integration is from groups who want one or two particular rights uh, to be protected. But I think what's refreshing and different about this current movement of reading the preamble in public and, and talking about it is that the demand is not that I want freedom of expression or the demand is not that I want um, you know right to livelihood. The demand really is that the constitution upholds the system, one, a set of values and secondly, a system through which processes have to take place and we want a kind of general commitment to both these values and the systems and it's not limited to a particular demographic and I think that's one of the hard things about it. Um, so I think the, the, the bigger question people have often asked is, you know, to go to court or not go to court, and there's a lot of American literature saying the courts are a hollow hope, they're sort of giving you false consciousness. But I think in India, the courts have always been just one part of a larger set of political practices. So it's never the court on either or, it's the court plus other things. And 
and maybe those of you who did it were very sensitive, at least in the early 2000s, I think the courts were very aware of what was happening outside the court. So, um, irrespective of the judge's ideological preferences, um, they would act to preserve the centrality of the court in constant interpretation. So, if it seemed that there was a widespread demand for right to information, the courts would be seemingly well disposed towards that idea. Um, I, I, I'm not sure why that's not been the case in the last few years. I think it's been um, uh, the, the inability of the court to act in time uh, and uh, the kind of um, very cautious decisions that have been coming out. Um, uh, I think this disappoints a lot of people. And um, the Indian court, and this has been sort of studied of political scientists, uh, far more than the executive legislature, when you have these sort of public opinion surveys, scores much higher in terms of uh, popular trust and legitimacy. And I think that's a very valuable resource which should not be squandered uh, due to short-term fears or for short-term concerns. Uh, and I think it's important for those of, those people who invested in courts to sort of, sort of keep that. I, mean, I don't want to give the court too much trend, but something that we're seeing happening increasingly in more and more cases is that courts just say that, listen, we can't determine what's happening because just there are such contradictory facts. Because we're also living in an era where misinformation is happening at a scale and a level where we have never seen it before. So then you have, you know, judges saying things like, I don't really care who's doing the violence, but I want it to stop. And I don't want to give them too much credit. What I'm saying is that even in the recent Kashmir communication shutdown case, the judgment which came out yesterday, if you read the initial first couple of paras, it's basically them talking about, it starts with Charles Dickens and they say it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of reason, it was the age of darkness, whatever. And they're like, you know, there's so many facts, like the state is saying something, the petitioners are saying something, we just can't figure this out. So what we're going to do is we're going to lay down some guidelines yeah. and then let the state do its own review. So do you see this uh, as a part of the court's general tendency to prefer sort of procedural uh, challenges over substantive determinations? So I think there are two parts to it. One which yeah. I think um, is understandable and one which is... Which is, which is not as understandable, it's okay. So the first part is, is, a, is, a, is a general problem, so the parts that we've been writing about it a lot, is that um, constitutional appellate courts don't really have a mechanism of adjudicating questions of evidence. So if you're going to a trial court, or even to a high court in its sort of general um, appellate or original jurisdiction, there is some way in which the court can um, put down rules to follow evidence. But the Supreme Court really can't. And in, in cases the Supreme Court becomes a court of first instance, uh, I think the Aadhaar case is one of the best examples of that. Um, there's really no great mechanism to ensure the court arrives at um, arrives at something that's close to the truth. Uh, which leads to a bizarre situation where the court is watching a PowerPoint presentation. It leads to the very disturbing practice of uh, evidence under seen covers. It also leads to all kinds of affidavits being put in and the affidavit is uh, not being uh, paid attention. I mean, it's not clear what the expertise of the person putting in the affidavit is. Um, uh, it shows up very early on, so the uh, Hanif Qureshi case is the longest judgment Supreme Court in its first decade. And that's partly because the court has to decide, is an absolute ban on cow slaughter bad for the economy? Right? So how does the court decide? And it looks at multiple reports that are submitted by different governments, state governments, central governments. And at one point the judges are just literally saying the figures say everything. Um, and then they sort of distill whatever figures they prefer. They say, look, it's rational to suggest this. Uh, and the reason why ultimately the Supreme Court changes its opinion, so in around 2005, Justice Lahoti writes an opinion which says it's clearly established that the cow for the entirety of its lifespan uh, is uh, a valuable animal because even when it stops producing milk, the cow dung and urine it produces is greater than the amount of money you have to spend uh, in feeding it. And they get the statistics from um, the Ministry of Agriculture in Gujarat, uh, which was now Mr. Modi's government. It's an report that's submitted. Uh, and the report is torn apart by the one dissenting judgment of Justice Marco. Uh, but his dissent doesn't make a difference, right? Because the court just cites as the government report and puts these statistics forward. Uh, this is what the truth is. So I think there's a large institutional problem um, for courts in India about how do you create a mechanism to, to deal with evidence. Um, and I think this is where um, international courts give us some, some ways. So in the US, uh, there's a very strong uh, system of uh, amicus briefs by experts. Um, so my historian colleague in the U.S. forever writing briefs for the American Supreme Court, sort of trying to distill materials. Um, I was very impressed by what the Kenyan court did recently in the kind of, uh, privacy case and how they admitted sort of technical evidence on question changing rights. The second part is um, courts in India tend to and increasingly seem to be saying, here are some nice principles, um, but we're not going to grant any relief. Um, 
And if you look at it carefully, I mean, the courts we have done this at any time of political crisis. So the much touted Golaknath uh, and Keshwananda Bharti judgments, they're both seen as the huge blows against uh, executive power. In Golaknath, um, the court said you cannot amend fundamental rights except for the fundamental right you've already amended. Uh, very simply, in case the party said, yes, a basic structure, we should strike down anything that takes away from basic structure. But all the amendments that you've done so far stand because they're not affecting basic structure. So it takes several years, Minerva Mills and, and, and Sapat Kumar for them to actually act on it. So they lay out these principles, they don't act, partly because they feel that if they act and the government ignores them, they're going to lose legitimacy. Um, but it's one thing for a court to do it in its early years, uh, when it's still unsure of its powers. Uh, it's disturbing to see it happen uh, at a point of time when the courts often being described as the most powerful court in the world. Uh, in fact, a lot of what's happening now uh, is similar to what the Pakistani courts have been doing in periods of military rule, where they say, well, your coup is legal, but your various regulations under the military coup are subject to judicial review as and when they come out, right? So you can only uh, arrest someone for 14 days, uh, 14 days, you can't arrest them for a month after 14 days of release, right? There's a kind of minor tinkering that they, that they do around the sides. Uh, the first is an institutional problem, the second is a political vision uh, strategy problem and needs to be resolved in both cases by leadership from the bar and, and the court. Okay, that cross-border example, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so I have one more question which is sort of related to the Qureshi case that you mentioned, right? Where people have to keep going back to the court again and again and again because you think, oh, the judgment is out, it's decided, this is over. But very often it's not. Because if you want to get the outcome you want, you're going to have to keep following through and make sure that the case actually follows whatever safeguards or principles have been laid down. Do you think that is true in general in case of like most litigation that has happened in India? Yeah, I think that's uh, again a kind of institutional problem. So uh, until and until continuing mandamus was sort of invented uh, in the right to case, there's basically uh, no way that the court has to ensure that its orders are being followed through. Uh, and I haven't seen a study, but at least anecdotally, it seems contempt powers are used more against uh, unruly advocates and clients than against uh, them for enforcing the final decision. Um, um, and I, and that, in mind, is really uh, it's important, but uh, the courts don't have the administrative capacity to keep doing that in every, in every respect. Um, I think a bigger question one needs to ask is uh, the courts in India are understaffed. So we talk about judicial delays, but both at the uh, Child court level and at uh, the appellate court levels, uh, with a massive shortage of judges. Uh, one of the things those of us who work as clerks realize that even inside the courts, there's a, a massive lack of administrative support in lots of, of, of basic functions. Um, since the court is doing administrative features, it needs more staff and more expertise. Um, and these again are solvable questions. There's a way in which these, these should be easily resolved, uh, but are not. Um, uh, the second part of repeated litigation uh, is that it's it's clear that uh, one party to a judgment is not going to be satisfied by it. So they're going to continue to try and, and go around it. Uh, which might mean strategically, uh, it, and this is something that a lot of people have been saying, is that one shouldn't begin with the Supreme Court. One should start uh, as lower down as possible. Um, perhaps not even start as a constitutional case, but start as a matter of administrative law or as uh, a matter of um, criminal civil procedure, and then sort of see uh, how the rules are working. Uh, it also sometimes depoliticizes a case when you bring it in as a technical question rather than a kind of rights question. That, that is certainly true because you're seeing more and more of these challenges, even against internet shutdowns and 144 orders being framed in very administrative law terms. Yeah. So it makes it much easier for the judges to do rather than have to assert like some broad constitutional right to protest, etc. Um, a related question to that. Uh, we're now seeing that some high courts are taking sort of a proactive and leading role in striking down these internet shutdowns or at least demanding answers from the government. The Allahabad High Court has taken so much of cognizance of internet shutdowns in UP. The Guwahati High Court had also directed restoration of internet services in Assam. But at the same time, there is this problem where whenever a high state level high court does something which sort of strikes back at the government, there's immediately a transfer petition moved to the Supreme Court and then there's an attempt to get everything to the Supreme Court. So do you think the first question is, has the role of high courts really been undermined in the last few years or maybe even decades? And the other is, what lessons can we draw from history? Historically, what kind of a role have high courts played in defending fundamental rights? So I think um, the high courts have always been um, like right from the time they were set up in the 18th, 18th century, kind of space for um, 
assertive rights. Um, so there are these famous stories in the early 19th century. The uh, governor of Bombay challenged the Chief Justice of Bombay to a duel because he wasn't happy with how they were, how they were, how, what he was deciding. He just went and strike and shut down the High Court in the 1820s. Who won the um, duel? Sorry. Who won the duel? I didn't happen. He just challenged him to a picture point. Uh, in the late 19th century, when the High Courts Act came in, they tried to implicitly clip the powers of the High Courts. Uh, for example, limiting writs only to the jurisdiction of the presidency towns, um, taking writs in specific relief and not having the original jurisdiction. Um, there are several reasons for this. One is that the high courts are uh, larger. Uh, they draw from people who've been both in civil judiciary and served all over the state and from the local bar. Uh, they're more responsive to the local bar. Um, and uh, many of them know that they're not going to make it up to the Supreme Court. So pleasing the government um, or pleasing uh, judges above them isn't necessarily like uh, a kind of incentive. They're, they're able to decide on their, on their own terms. Uh, when the Federal Court of India was set up um, in 37, most high courts had severe objections to it. Um, the Bombay High Court Chief Justice used to come to the inauguration of the Federal Court saying that, you know, uh, Delhi is a backwater swamp. It has no lawyers worth note. Uh, we are proud ancient 200 year old high courts. What is this new high court going to do? And even when the Supreme Court set up in its early years, it wasn't seen as a space for uh, legal talent. Uh, a lot of judges, uh, Chawla, for example, was offered a Supreme Court position very early on and he was reluctant to move uh, to the court. Uh, in the 50s, uh, there are several people, uh, Durga Bhai Deshmukh, for example, who found that, you know, instead of being a judge, she preferred to be in the planning commission, but she thought that's where the action would be. Um, so uh, the court began as a, as a, as a small uh, conservative institution, largely concerned with kind of uh, not big rights questions, but more sort of procedural questions. It really builds a kind of reputation and brand for itself in the 1970s. It's also a point of time when the Delhi bar begins to increase. Um, if you look at demographics, Delhi's population sort of shoots up uh, in the early 90s. Uh, the Delhi Law Factory is a great example. It moves from a very small law faculty to one that has three campuses, produces several thousand lawyers every year. Uh, and recent studies show the Supreme Court primarily hears cases from Delhi or its surrounding states. So, uh, I mean, there are questions that one can ask about uh, what gets admitted to the Supreme Court. Um, uh, also, access to justice. Yeah, so how do we define access to the Supreme Court? And, uh, of course, governments are going to try, try to bring transferations or adverse to the court, but should the Supreme Court admit those transfer transferations? I'm not necessarily sure the Supreme Court telling litigants to go to the High Court first is a bad idea, uh, provided they also don't admit transferations the moment the High Court gives a kind of adverse judgment. And one needs to think really of judicial federalism in, in a better way, allowing um, the High Court to respond first before sort of coming to the Supreme Court, unless it's a matter of like really critical, immediate response. And I mean, that would also seem like some litigation practice because then you get like two chances. So even sure. if things don't go in your favor. And but also yeah. you have reliance. So for example, if you're at a high court um, and there's a lawyer before you, he's probably a lawyer who knows the clients, the case of a habeas yeah. corpus petition. Whereas in the Supreme Court, it's somebody else who's representing another set of lawyers from Chhattisgarh. So there are multiple, and a, and a lot of, um, what little I see, um, uh, courts seem to be elevated space, but they're really small communities. So the one thing I realized when I was working in Supreme Court, I haven't practiced, so my main exposure was doing research in the court those days, is that uh, lawyers seem to spend like 80% of the time in the court standing in the corridors and gossiping, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a really small community, it's based on trust, uh, everyone has a lot of information about the others, it's based on reputation. And, uh, in, and and because of that, very often when judges respond, they respond not just to the merits of the case, but also who's bringing the case forward. And that, is, that there's also kind of, kind of institutional merit to sort of bring this down to a lower level, rather than keeping it um, uh, amongst kind of elite legal fraternity in Delhi. I mean, I think one of the problems that we have sort of encountered when you're doing these kinds of, especially digital rights or tech cases before the Supreme Court, is that the judges don't fully understand the technology involved. So, for instance, like most internet cases will just be like, oh my god, do you know we can get the things you can get on the dark web? Yeah, and that's also a problem in that sense with the Constitution because the Constitution was adopted in 1950 and now you have technologies like artificial intelligence, facial recognition, etc. So how, in that sense, do we use a constitution that was enacted 79 years ago to fight these challenges now? Well, I think the work you guys have done shows that you actually can, the constitution serves very well, right? So I think for a lot of technology cases, um, we forget that even early on, there were always questions of technology, right? So for example, uh, is the drawing of uh, blood from a person accusing a criminal case, is it something that can be 
satisfies the constitutional test against self incrimination? Uh, can you force someone to take a breathalyzer test? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of surveillance can you do in the 60s and 70s? So I think there are ways in which those questions can get passed very easily. Uh, I think the problem where the constitution runs up against the problem is when it really comes to the question of uh, federal powers. Mm -hmm. Because um, our constitution has a very clear uh, unitary bias. It's written at a time when uh, the country is partitioned, there are fears of this federal tendency, there's this need to have a centralized government that's going to transform the economy. So it, it sort of weighs the constitution very heavily towards the center. Uh, but which is why we have organizations like the CBI, which are on um, slightly dubious legal ground, uh, because technically law and order remains the state subject. The CBI is tied to the Special Police Establishment Act. It's supposed to only act in Delhi, but it clearly acts across the country. And I see similar problems arising in the tech question when you're setting up um, databases, uh, where a database is located, which wing of government has power over them. Uh, it comes up with questions of silos of information. Is information to be siloed at the central level or federal level? Right. So I think the rights questions actually, as, as the work that you guys have been doing shows, can be addressed with the constitution. I think it's the kind of administrative um, ownership of technology, wings of government, um, the bizarre uh, legality of something like the UI. The, it is what the constitution is not really clear about and in some ways we haven't really gone and I mean I know there are a couple of challenges in the CBI but I haven't heard of uh, sort of federal challenges to the other kind of information side and I think that's where one needs to think and perhaps in the future perhaps think of having more specific statutory or legal provisions uh, around that. I think another related issue that comes up with which is sort of at the intersection of, you know, these kind of new technology database projects like Aadhaar and federalism is that we are now increasingly seeing things being passed as money bills. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this attempt to completely bypass the Rajya Sabha and undermine its importance again. So do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, I'm just going to quote Supreme Court and say it's a fraud of the constitution. So, <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that, that, that one can agree on. And I'm glad at least the money bill question has been reopened. Uh, it was surprising it didn't address the other question. Um, similarly, bringing in ordinances which lapse uh, yeah. very quickly. Um, uh, and I think it's again a reminder, uh, a lot of people in the general constitution thought that Rajya Sabha was unnecessary. Yeah. But I think it's a reminder why it is necessary and the need to sort of um, not think. I mean, there's a lot of argument that suggests that, okay, a government's won an election decisively, which gives it a, man gives it a mandate. But um, there are multiple electorates in India and the electorates are staggered over time. So there's no one group that has a mandate for everything at one point. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's that's an, that, that's the easy question to answer. The money should be just, just, yeah. So sort of in retrospect, the Rajas about being there as an institution to act as a check in the Balwak is probably something. I mean, one can maybe think about better representation than Rajasabha, but yeah, I think it, it very much needs to exist. Exist. Um, a related question because we were also talking about Aadhaar. So there seems to be this obsession with the government, and this is not just true for the current government, yeah. but even previous governments, right? You want to identify, enumerate, and categorize citizens yeah. and put them into databases. Yeah. Be it Aadhaar, be it the proposed national population register, etc. So I was wondering if historically there have been similar attempts made by governments, maybe even the colonial <coughs> government, to do this kind of a database creation exercise. Of course, now with technology. You can, you know, have databases integrated with each other, you can make them talk to each other, you can do profiling. So all of that was not possible earlier. But has there been like, you know, Ham Kagas Nahi Dikhayenge kind of a movement earlier as well that we can draw lessons from? Sure, I mean, the most famous one people have talked about this is really um, what happens to Indians overseas. Um, so Gandhi in South Africa, it, so, there are, so um, one of the bizarre things about being British subjects is being a British subject gives you more rights outside of India than it does inside India. So uh, Indians travel across the British Empire. In many cases, they make claims to rights that local populations, say uh, blacks, blacks in South Africa and Kenya, are unable to do so. It clearly disturbs the kind of white ruling class and they bring a lot of restrictive laws um, to enumerate, fix, limit immigration. Um, to go from the aside, it's kind of tragic that we're having this debate about citizenship because South Asians as a population have lost citizenship in multiple places across the 20th century. So um, Indians in the United States uh, were stripped of citizenship uh, in the early 20s when they decided that uh, Indians were Aryan, but they were also not white. So they didn't class, they, they fell under the Asian region. They were expelled from East Africa. They had their rights limited in Malaysia. They were sort of suppressed in Guyana and Fiji. Uh, they were sort of uh, made stateless in Sri Lanka. And uh, I think we of all people should be cognizant of what happens when these kind of documentaries don't fit and we seem to be going ahead with it. Um, in the Indian context, um, 
there have been several attempts. Uh, Tarangini Shiraman has a great book out on the sort of history of identification cards in India. And what she shows is that at every point of time, sort of beginning um, with the Second World War, there's been a kind of attempt to enumerate and create a, docu a, a, a final document that will fix who you are. And the, the use, the language around it is always the same. Uh, it's partly national security, it's mostly welfare. And there's always a story of the ghostly grandmother who's been dead for 10 years but is taking national cards. We have to kind of get rid of her from the list. Uh, but it suddenly shows sort of each moment. So the ration card in the 1940s, the kind of move in the 70s, in the early 90s, in 2000, all of these movements failed because you realize there's actually a problem with this one document that you have. It's actually not complete. Um, there's another interesting work by uh, a political scientist called Kamal uh, Sadiq who works on something called paper citizenship. So he says uh, in the West, citizenship is really tied to you being on a particular database and being fixed. But in South Asia, and in actually much of the world, because firstly borders are, are not fixed, uh, they were determined very late, much later on, and, and the state capacity is limited. Um, most people access citizenship through multiple identities, multiple documents. So some people are voters, and some people are welfare recipients, and some people have passports, and one person might not have all three. Uh, and it seems from the government's point of view quite chaotic, but for the individual themselves, it often helps them navigate a kind of very difficult situation. Right? Um, and I think one of the best examples is people living on the Indo-Bangladesh border, um, where the border politically shifted over a period of time, but also geographically shifts because, you know, the river just moves somewhere else, and you suddenly find it first stranded on the other side. Um, and not sort of, I mean, in, in a way, what Sadi shows is that, that there's a kind of Jugaad survivalism. I don't want to glorify it, but that is a reality for most people in, in South Asia and the rest of the world. And to imagine a technological fix will solve it, um, maybe at one point it will, but so far every technology that we do it hasn't actually solved it. Um, I think the second question is why is the state so interested? And, uh, I think in the past, the state was interested because it wanted um, information for itself. It wanted to know who's available, wanted to sort of track its voters. But I think some of the work you guys are showing is now this information has become a kind of um, marketable commodity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the state that wants to know um, who's in the database, it's private parties that want to know who's in the database. And I think that's actually, I mean, again, the work that part of you will be doing is important because I think the argument against private corporations Access and information is perhaps more powerful than whether the state can access it or not. And um, while many people might trust the state for good or wrong reasons, most of us distrust private corporations. <laughs> so I think that's an argument that, that needs to have a, a, a greater say. And I think that's one of the things that, in some ways, um, one has to be creative with the constitution because much of it does not seem to apply to private parties. Um, Gotham's work using Article 15 is an interesting way to think about it. The other ways of trying to use um, Article 21 to sort of uh, create protections against uh, private entities as well. Especially big tech platforms, right? Like I think someone had recently tweeted saying, if you were locked out of your Google account today, do you think your life would recover? Mm -hmm. And I know mine won't. So, I mean, the level of significance and power that these companies have compared to the kind of obligations that they have seem to be, there seems to be some kind of a disparity there. But it also, based on our work, and again, this is like an insight from the litigation that we've been doing, people really seem to want these databases to be available to private parties also. For instance, LinkedIn.